Hello and welcome again to our study on James. Today we complete our study as we enter into chapter 4 verse 11 and we work our way through the end of James's letter. As we prepare for this study, let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of justice and righteousness, we invite your presence into our final day of study together. We open, Lord, again, your scriptures as you spoke through your servant James, who encouraged us to be hearers and doers of your word. In the spirit of James, and by your Holy Spirit, open our minds and our hearts to hear and to receive everything that you say to us today. Amen. I have enjoyed our study together, and as we begin to reflect on James, uh, we recognize that he draws from the Old Testament law as contained in such books as Leviticus. I'd like to share some of Leviticus uh, with you before we begin today's study. I want you to listen for this um, rewording that James has of these Levitical laws as he applies them to the first first century Christians. Uh, they are looking at not just the Old Testament. Remember, they were Jewish Christians. So the Old Testament was their Bible. The New Testament was just beginning to be written and shared among the believers. And so as James writes his letter, he is writing it from an Old Testament perspective, but he is also writing the letter from the perspective of God revealed in our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Hear these words from Leviticus chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. We will be reading through uh, verse 18, and I am going to be reading from the Contemporary English Bible Version. These are the words that the Lord God spoke to Moses, telling Moses to share these words with his chosen people, the Israelites. You must not steal, nor deceive, nor lie to each other. You must not swear falsely by my name, desecrating your God's name in doing so, I am the Lord. You must not oppress your neighbor or rob them. Do not withhold a hired laborer's pay overnight. You must not insult a deaf person or put some obstacle in front of a blind person that would cause them to trip. Instead, fear your God. I am the Lord. You must not act unjustly in a a legal case. Do not show favoritism to the poor or deference to the great. You must judge your fellow Israelites fairly. Do not go around slandering your people. Do not stand by while your neighbor's blood is shed. I am the Lord. You must not hate your fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your fellow Israelite strongly so you don't become responsible for his sin. You must not take revenge nor hold a grudge against any of your people. Instead, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, says the Lord our God in this reading from Leviticus 19, verses 11 through 18. Now let us begin our study of James in chapter 4, beginning with verses 11 through 12. And we're going to do the same thing we've done in previous weeks. We're just going to simply walk through these verses a bit at a time, seeking God's understanding and God's word for God's people, you and me. Brothers and sisters, don't say evil things about each other. Whoever insults or criticizes a brother or sister insults and criticizes the law. Sound familiar? 
we can see already as we begin reading that James is drawing from these Levitical teachings of the law as found in Leviticus 19. If you find fault with the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge over it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, and he is able to save and to, and to destroy. But you who judge your neighbor, who are you? The law, again, that James is referring to is not a local law. It's not a state law. In some ways, it is a national law, but it's not man's law. It's God's law. It's God's law is found in the Old Testament. Verse 11 speaks to us about talking about our brother and sister and judging the law uh, as we judge them. So to speak against someone, we go back to chapter 1 uh, in the beginning of his letter where he talks, or in chapter 1 through 3, where he talks to us about taming the tongue and the importance of not um, slandering someone, but that we are not to kill our brothers and sisters through the tongue, through the words that we speak. Uh, in this instance, we hear even Jesus speaking to us in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, where Jesus says, if you have something against your neighbor, we go to them. We go to them face to face first, and then if they don't listen, we take two witnesses with us. And then we speak to them again, and if they don't listen to us again, and then we speak to them in front of the community, and if they still won't listen, and then it says it's interesting. It says we treat them as a Gentile. Now, what that means is not that, it's, that we excommunicate them from the community, but that we treat them as someone who does not believe, and we win the people to the kingdom through the love of God. James says that when we judge another, um, it's, it's not an act of equalization. It's uh, where we end up standing on uneven ground. It's where we try to have power over someone, where we lower our neighbor and elevate ourselves. It's not a standing with. Therefore, he says that <clears throat> we are to speak to our neighbors face to face and not behind their back because when we speak to them behind their back and not face to face, it ends up to be things that we would equate today to gossiping and backstabbing and secret judging of the other person. To judge, according to James, is simply to be arrogant. Uh, arrogant is not just a puffing out of the chest, but equates to the way that we treat one another. It, it equates to actions. Uh, when we read here in verses 13 through 16, we find this word arrogance that actually is used. And it is used, listen for it, it's used in the Greek. Uh, Alizania, I believe is the way it is pronounced. Uh, that term would be familiar to the original hearers of this letter of James who were, remember, were living in this Greco-Roman world, were familiar with Greek literature. And so it's a Greek literary term that is used to define the character within the story who speaks loudly and foolishly and brags and boasts. Arrogance, as James sees it, is sinful actions. Listen now to verses 13 through 16 and see if we can pick this out. Pay attention, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town. We will stay there a year buying and selling and making a profit. You don't really know about tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for only a short while before it vanishes. Here's what you ought to say. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast and brag. There's that word, arrogance. All such boasting, all such arrogance is evil, James says. It is a sin when someone knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it. <laughs>
boasting, boasting, arrogance. It's almost as if when we were, or as, or as if we were praying the Lord's Prayer, and instead of saying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, we end up saying, My will be done, My kingdom come. It is a sin, James says, when someone knows the right thing to do and does not do it. As Christians, we are called to submission to God's will, not ours. The thing that I find interesting about this section of James is that he is saying that we know the right thing to do. It's not that these sins or this arrogance is committed out of ignorance, meaning just out of lack of knowledge, but it's the wise ones, the knowledgeable ones that are acting in ways that are destroying others or judging others. Chapter 5 verses 1 through 6. Here again, these words, and perhaps reflect upon what we read in Leviticus chapter 19. Pay attention, you wealthy people. Weep and moan over the miseries coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. Moths have destroyed your clothes. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you. It will eat your flesh like fire. Consider the treasure you have hoarded in the last days. Listen, hear the cries of the wages of your field hands. These are the workers of the fields. These are the wages you stole from those who harvested your fields. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of heavenly forces. You have lived a self-satisfying life on this earth, a life of luxury. You have stuffed your hearts in preparation for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who doesn't oppose you. The selling and the hoarding for profit is a form of manipulation. It's not a form of gaining wealth in order to serve neighbor, but it's a form of hoarding up or storing up for your own future and for your own security. James even goes on to say that they're stealing. They're stealing from the earth. They're stealing from the workers. Leviticus 19 verse 13 speaks specifically against holding a worker's pay overnight. A worker is due their wages. In verse 6, he says that they have condemned or murdered the righteous one. I don't know about you, but when I first read this, especially in the New Testament, I'm thinking, oh, he's speaking of Jesus who died innocently for our sins, willingly for our sins. But in this context, James is talking about the workers in the field those who have worked willingly for, the, for those who hired them and yet did not grumble against their employer, did not um, work against their employer, but for their employer, and yet were not treated fairly. They were not paid. These are the ones, according to James, that God favors. Remember, it is those who humble themselves before God and one another, those who seek to live their lives patterned after the heart of God. In Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus is speaking of uh, a section which we have learned to call the Beatitudes. And in that, he talks about those who are blessed. The very first one is interesting. The very first Beatitude, the first blessing is, Blessed or happy are those who are humble. Why? 
because those are the ones who will inherit the earth. Last week in chapter 3, we learned that deeds done in meekness are born of God, not from humans, and those are called humble deeds. Luke Timothy Johnson, the writer of the commentary for James in the New International Bible Commentary, says this. He says, The world is as the arrogant suppose, a closed system whose prize goes to the ruthless. It is instead an open system, answerable to the God who creates it. The world is not the arrog as the arrogant suppose, a closed system whose prize goes to the ruthless. It is an open system, answerable to the God who creates it. The fourth beatitude that we find in Matthew says, Blessed or happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That righteousness and that seeking after righteousness is not a self-righteousness, but a God or godly righteousness. Let us reflect for just a moment. I wonder how we would look at James and this connection between envy and arrogance. Remember, to envy is to covet what our neighbor has, to grasp after what we don't have or we think that we need, the things that we think will make us happy. And in James, he seems to say that this envy, remember, when it grows up, uh, leads to this arrogance, these actions, these attitudes of self-righteousness that leads us to acts of violence, not only against God's people, against one another, but also against God's creation, God's world. Hmm. Blessed are those who will humble themselves before the Lord because they are the true inheritors of God's creation, God's earth. The earth belongs to the humble. And those who seek God's righteousness will have what they hunger and thirst for. And that is to live within the will of God. God's kingdom come. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Moving on in chapter 5, we will be looking at verses 7 through 20. We will break those down. But as we look at those verses, these verses that we're getting ready to enter into seem to answer this question, so what shall we do? Uh, which is a question we've continued to ask as we've studied James together. How do we live for God in a world that seems hell-bent on living envious and arrogant lives? As Johnson puts it, what does a world governed by Jesus' faith, the law of love, look like? How does friendship with God affect the way persons speak and act toward one another? Let's dig into these next few verses together. Verses 7 through 11. Therefore, brothers and sisters, you must be patient as you wait for the coming of the Lord. Not interesting. James expects Jesus to return. So this is post-resurrection, post-ascension, living in this new time, this liminal time, if you will, between the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ and his returning again. And how are we to conduct ourselves? We must be patient as we wait for the coming of the Lord. Consider the farmer who waits patiently for the coming of rain in the fall and spring, looking forward to the precious fruit of the earth. You also must wait patiently, strengthening your resolve, because the coming of the Lord is near. Don't complain about each other, brothers and sisters, so that you won't be judged. Look, the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of the patient resolve and steadfastness. <clears throat> 
Look at how we honor those who have practiced endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen what the Lord has accomplished, for the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Be patient as you wait for the coming of the Lord. There was a song, a hymn, many years ago, back in 1969, that was the song of the year. It was composed by Ari Resnick, and it was sung, or the title of the song was Jesus is Coming Soon, and the chorus goes like this, and no, I'm not going to sing to you. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will surely sound. All of the dead shall rise. Righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Again, James expects this imminent return of Jesus. Now, that was close to 2,000 plus years ago, and we're still waiting uh, but again, we are reminded that our time and God's time are, are not the same. Uh, and so we wait patiently for the return of our Lord. Not included in many of the recordings of the Jesus is Coming Soon song is verse 2. Listen to these and see how these connect with how we are studying James today. Love of so many cold. Losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told. Evils abound. Sounds like the warnings from James, doesn't it? The desires for the gold and the lusting after the riches of others that are self-serving and self-righteous ways of living that lead us to death. Isn't it fascinating that even in 1969, as we brought that hymn into the church and we began to sing it, we chose to leave out those words, those warnings against self-righteousness versus godly righteousness. The community whose heart is set on God waits patiently, James says. In other words, we wait patiently, but we don't sit idly by. We actually live. We keep our hearts focused on God. It's not that contemplative piety that we practice. It's an active living, a God-filled life. In the world, it is natural for the stress of the oppression, the, um, the stress of the, the pandemic, COVID-19 that we are going through, the social injustices that we are navigating our way through, and for those who continue to endure these social injustices, not only in America, but in the world, it is natural for us, as James says in chapter 5, verse 9, to complain against each other, to grumble against one another. And he says when we do that, that is not cooperation it is competition one against the other and it causes us to take our eyes off of God and place our eyes on self and the preservation of self and he said instead of doing that we are called to wait like Job now Job was not known as a prophet but many of us even today are familiar with the book of Job that is found in the Old Testament the Jewish Christian people often look to Job as an example of righteous long-suffering. We look today to Job for righteous long-suffering, uh, that patiently waiting on God's justice and God's will to prevail. Job reminds us that the righteous who wait will see justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's not Job. Those are words are also not Martin Luther King's words. They are actually from one of the prophets, Amos, who spoke God's word to Israel, telling them that there is plenty good life ahead for those who will seek God and live and who seek good and not evil, for they also will live. James 1, 12, chapter 1, verse 12, reminds us that blessed is anyone who endures temptation, who overcomes human temptation by seeking God's will instead of their own. Verse 12, verse 12 of chapter 5 of James. Most important, my brothers and sisters, never make a solemn pledge 
neither by heaven nor earth, nor by anything else. Instead, speak with a simple yes or no, or else you may fall under judgment. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. We've heard that said before, haven't we? We are not to swear by God. We're not to swear by earth. We're not to swear by heaven. Leviticus 19 verse 12 warns against swearing by God's name. Even in Matthew chapter 5 verse 37, it says, Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Those were on the lips of Jesus in Matthew. When we live like this, we don't live as one who is swayed by every wind uh, of mankind or humankind, but we stand firm waiting for the word from God. We build our trust in God and we, we navigate forward when God tells us to move. When we live like that, when we live grounded in God's love and God's will, we live as someone who can be trusted, as authentic people. And authenticity and trust will build a community, not destroy it. James has a few words to say about prayer in verses 13 through 16. Here are these words. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing which is also a form of prayer, my friends. If any of you are sick, they should call for the elders of the church and the elders should pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. For this reason, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. Throughout my 25 plus years of ministry, uh, in serving in many different contexts within the church and also uh, at Ferrum for the last six years, um, we have had prayer groups powerful, powerful prayer groups who um, have done some mighty work for God, uh, not bending God's will to ours, but our will to God's. It's interesting that as we look at these verses 13 through 16 in chapter 5 of James's letter, this isn't about how we are going to pray, but when we are to pray and for whom we are to pray. We're to pray in times of trouble, in times of suffering. We are to pray when we are happy. We sing. We are to pray for the sick. When we pray for the sick, this is the first place in James where he says, call the elders of the community, ecclesia. It's the only place in James that this is found, ecclesia a Greek word that means community of believers. We call that today, friends, the church, the elders of the church, the community of the believers, the elders of the believers, the leaders of the believers. They are called to use oil, not as some magical solution and not necessarily even as it was used in the Old Testament, which is often anointing to set apart for the work of God. But here, we wonder if James, again, is, is drawing from the Greco-Roman world in which oil was used medicinally as a cure for illness and disease. He seems to be making a point that this medical uh, healing and this spiritual healing, the prayer and the medicine seem to work together, not against one another. Who were the sick? Even in this first century in which James is writing, the sick were always those who were marginalized. They were isolated, quarantined, as we would today. Quarantined. If you, if you go outside of the area, you have to stay out for two weeks. If you show signs of COVID-19, then you have to stay home for two weeks until you're without signs. 
We isolated the sick and, the, and marginalized those who had different forms of diseases. Here James says, call the elders of the church and have them pray over the sick. Have them anoint them with this medicinal oil this connection between physical and spiritual healing sounds a lot like Jesus to me, who dared to walk among the sick, who dared to sit down and eat with those who were marginalized, who raised the dead and healed the dying. In verse 16, James says we are called to confess our sins before one another. Now, before you pick up the phone and you call your best friend and you say, hey, I need to tell you everything that I've done, and then we're going to tell it to the church, and then we're going to tell it to the city, and then we're going to tell it to the state because we're called to confess our sins before everyone. That is not exactly what James is talking about here. It's not a call to hearing individual confession. Everywhere in verse 16 that you and yours is not singular, it's plural. And what James seems to be saying here is that the individual sin impacts the community. The community sins impact the city. The city sins impact the state. The state sins impact the nation. The nations impact the world. We are all connected. The yous and the yours are all plural. So what James is calling us to is as a community of faith, we are to confess our sins before one another. There is a place for community prayer, for the confessions of the community in our times of worship together. In verse 17, Elijah is used as an example of one whose righteous prayer can move things or change things. He says this, Elijah was a person just like us, a prophet, my friends, who was human just like you and me. And when he earnestly prayed that it wouldn't rain, no rain fell for three and a half years. And then he prayed again and God sent rain and the earth produced its fruit. He's drawing there from the story as found in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 through chapter 18, verse 45. Here in this section of James's letter, he simply wants to make the point. They were familiar with the story. If you're not familiar, go read it. And Elijah isn't just a prophet from God. Elijah is human flesh, just like you, just like me, a common person who was a righteous prayer warrior who made a great impact on the community of God's people. In Matthew um, chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, we hear this story of the seeking after the one sheep, the shepherd who seeks after the one lost sheep, leaving the 99 behind. There's something similar to that going on in James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. When James writes, My brothers and sisters, if any of you wander from the truth and someone turns back the wanderer, recognize that whoever brings a sinner back from the wrong path will save them from death and will bring about the forgiveness of many sins. That is where James ends his letter, and I find this an interesting place for him to end. If any one, and that is singular, if any one of you wanders and one, singular, brings them back, then it impacts the community. The mutual concern and care for one in the one another in the community impacts the community. It is important how we treat one another. I want to share with you a dream, literally a dream that I had many years ago when I was in my mid-20s. Uh, many of our students at Ferrum College have heard me share this dream with them. I was a youth counselor in my local church, 
and there was a lot of turmoil among my youth. Uh, they were in conflict with one another. They were dealing with peer pressure. Some of them were dealing and battling with drug addictions. And I had this dream one night in which I was running through a field and there were youth that were running behind me. The field was green, but I knew that we were running not because we were just enjoying the green pastures, but because we were being pursued by Satan himself. And as I ran across the field, I knew that I was trying to bring all of those youth into a place of safety. And I reached this rock wall, um, rock small wall like a fence uh, like you would see probably in England and perhaps even some of our um, some of our farms to even today that would have a rock wall rather than a fence and I knew that I had to get them over to the other side in order to save them so I straddled the the wall and I could see Satan bearing down on us and I grabbed one youth and I don't remember whether it was male or female but I knew it was a young person and I was helping them over the wall and as I pulled them over I collapsed and they collapsed on the other side and I remember just weeping and wailing because I had lost all of the other young people. I had not saved any of them. And almost audibly in this dream I could hear God say, I never ask you to save them all. If you can make a difference to one, just one, that's all I've asked you to ever do. I hear those words echoed here in James. I also hear those words echoed in the parable of the lost sheep as found in Matthew chapter 18 where the shepherd leaves the flock of 99 or the flock of yeah the flock of 99 there's a flock of 100 one of them was lost and so he leaves the 99 and he goes and he seeks after the one because the one can impact the community when they are brought back into the community one makes a difference I know this sounds like a very odd way to close our study on James. I hope you have enjoyed this study. But I'd like to share at least a portion of Michael Jackson's song, Man in the Mirror, because that's where it all starts, isn't it? We have to start not just with the one out there, but the one here. And James calls us to examine ourselves, to find ourselves grounded in God with an eye that sees the way God sees and loves the way God loves. And it begins with this self-examination. In the words of Michael Jackson, man in the mirror, I'm going to make a change. For once in my life, it's going to feel real good. Going to make a difference. Going to make it right. As I turn up the collar on my favorite winter coat, this wind is blowing my mind. I see the kids in the streets with not enough to eat. Who am I to be blind? pretending not to see their needs. A summer's disregard, a broken bottle top, and one man's soul. They follow each other on the wind, you know, because they got nowhere to go. That's why I want you to know. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways, and no message could have been any clearer if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. And then this poignant verse. I've been a victim of a selfish kind of love. It's time that I realize 
that there are some with no home, not a nickel to loan. Could it be really me pretending that they're not alone? A willow deeply scarred, somebody's broken heart, and a washed out dream. They follow the pattern of the wind, you see, because they got no place to be. That's why I'm starting with me. I'm starting with the man or the woman in the mirror. I'm asking him or her to change his ways and no message could have been any clearer. If you wanna make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for this study, this time that we have shared together. We pause for a moment, Lord, and we invite that your thoughts become our thoughts. That your heart becomes our heart. That your ways become our ways. Because, Lord, it is as your servant, Teresa of Avila, once said, Christ has no body now but ours. No hands, no feet on earth but ours. Ours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on the world. Ours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Ours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Our hands, our feet, our eyes. We are his body, for Christ has no body now on earth but ours. So may we live each day. So may it be. In Christ's holy name, amen. Thank you for sharing this time with me as your chaplain. Thank you for sharing this time as the Ferrum College community. And for those who have joined us through Facebook and for our friends and family who have received these studies, thank you as well. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom. Goodbye and God bless.